Nearly one in four American workers are barely getting by, even though they are fully employed. There used to be a social contract between employer and employee. If the company was profitable, you would have a wage that was a living wage. The attitude of management seems to be that labor is a renewable resource. Just use it up one batch and then you get another one. But how hard do the working poor really have it? I'm not denying that there are poor Americans by our standards, but to be poor in America today is not to be in dire straits. Poverty is a relative concept. For August 26, 2002, this is Investigative Reports. They are known as the working poor or wage slaves, the millions of workers in America who are trying to get by on minimum wage. Today, one quarter of the American workforce earns between seven and eight dollars an hour. That's only about fifteen thousand dollars a year. The federal minimum wage is just $5.15 an hour. In tonight's special edition of Investigative Reports, we will witness the experiences of five Americans as they do their best to support their families and pursue the American dream in today's economy. We'll also talk to experts and economists who debate how the numbers do and don't add up for America's working poor as we take an inside look at the lives of minimum wage workers. Poverty in America can be camouflaged by a paycheck. When they punch a time clock or pass us in the office, ironically, the poor become harder to see. When you say uh, to most Americans that uh, almost one out of five of our children in this country is living in poverty, most middle and upper middle class Americans just don't believe it. They don't see it. Who is it that does these low income jobs? Well, the fact is that it's an awful lot of people of all races and all backgrounds, people whose families have been in this country for a very long time, because we're talking about millions and millions of people. Many of them don't think of themselves as poor, but they, they sure know they got problems. The working poor are not on the fringes of American society. They are the fabric of it. They're the ones who clean the hotel rooms, ring up your purchases, and answer the customer service lines. Award-winning journalist and best-selling author Barbara Ehrenreich sensed there was a story behind the status quo. Could millions of Americans actually be getting by on $15,000 a year? To investigate, Ehrenreich walked away from her comfortable existence as an author and social observer and started a new life in the apron and name tag world of the minimum wage worker. Erin Reich wrote about her experiences in her best-selling book, Nickel and Dimed, an eye-opening examination of how American prosperity looks from the bottom up. The challenge for me as a journalist that I took on was to see if I could do it, just, just try it for myself, just go out there and, and get jobs I could get from the Help Wanted ads and see if I could support myself. I was a waitress, a hotel housekeeper, a nursing home aid, a maid with a house cleaning service, and a Walmart floor clerk. All of these jobs were physically very demanding. I mean, they were truly exhausting. I was a little bit more surprised that they were mentally very challenging jobs. I learned a very kind of humbling lesson that no job is unskilled. Every job takes skill and intelligence and concentration. You end up at that kind of wage level in a lifestyle of chronic deprivation. There are always things you can't have, including things you need, like medical care and prescription drugs. And it's a lifestyle of relentless, low-level punishment. Were the hardships recounted by Barbara Ehrenreich reflective of the reality shared by millions? Over the next two hours, Investigative reports will spend time with five different low-wage families and share the human experience behind the statistics. 23-year-old Virginia Perry lives in a Las Vegas motel with her five-year-old son, Justin. They have a 400-square-foot motel room with Virginia's parents. You're gonna pick me a page to color for you? Me and my husband separated, and I came to stay with my parents because I had nowhere else to go. And with a child, it's better to have your parents or family at least around you than it is not to have nobody. 
No, I mean, I don't think it's the best thing to do, but you got to do what you got to do in order to make it. Virginia works at a local dry cleaners. She loves her job, but finds it is hard to move out on her own, on the money she earns. Virginia makes $7.25 an hour. Her parents help her with Justin, but she would like for him to have a real home. Yeah, but why don't we push it on the ground? Watch. If you push it on the ground, it's better. That was a good one, dude. He keeps telling me he wants a house so he can have a playground. I didn't win. Can I make it? Just count with me. Two. But he's, he's fine here. It doesn't bother him very much. I mean, I would like to have something bigger, too, for him. But right now, we've got to handle what we have. Sometimes I'll be really happy and think that, you know, life is wonderful. And, and it, sometimes I think that life could be a lot better. According to the Economic Policy Institute, nearly one quarter of low-income families were unable to make a rent or mortgage payment at some point during a 12-month period. The change in the way families are living in the 20th and the 21st century has been very dramatic. We basically doubled the number of young children who have a mother in the workforce in the last part of the 20th century. In Loxley, Alabama, 28-year-old Sandra Gale Hurst is raising two children alone. She has to work two jobs to make ends meet. See, after my, my marriage failed, after I got divorced, I declared bankruptcy. I make $7,000 a year. It's divided by 24, and that's what I bring home after they take out taxes. So I bring home 233 33 every two weeks. I live paycheck to paycheck. If I get a, you know, I get a paycheck, I make sure all the bills that are due for the next two weeks are paid um, before the kids do anything or before I do anything. Then we buy groceries, and then, you know, the rest goes to buy other stuff that's needed or, you know, something fun for them, whatever. Some days I feel poor, most of the time, no. I'm broke. Being broke is you don't have enough money to, to make it. I think poor is a state of mind. At 5.15 an hour, a person making minimum wage will earn only $206 a week before taxes. Many low-wage workers find that they must take two or more jobs to support their families. Ronald Rooney is 52 years old. He supports his wife and three children in South Central Los Angeles by working as an in-home health care provider. He makes $6.75 an hour. I have quadriplegics and paraplegics. Because of my experience and my physical capabilities, I get the tough patients, and uh, they need care every day, seven days a week. I clean them up, give them a bed bath, wash them, shave them, take their blood pressure, respiration, uh, pulse, change a dressing if they have a wound. How does it feel? Feels pretty good. Change their linen. I cook them breakfast, lunch, or dinner, uh, wash the dishes, clean up, vacuum, straighten up, light housekeeping, nothing real major. And I, said, hey, I don't care what kind of work it is. I don't care how low it is, how other people perceive it. Uh, it's, it's not too low for me if I'm earning money and it's legal. It's, uh, it's okay with me. I need to take care of my family. The median hourly wage for home health aides is $8.21 an hour. 41-year-old Sophia Acosta works as a receptionist at a nonprofit mental health agency in Miami. She is divorced with two grown children and a son living at home. She has found it difficult to get a better paying job without a high school diploma. I answer phones, give out information and referrals. I, um, I accept the donations as they come in. Everything comes through this front desk. <laughs> because of the, the cash flow that runs in this, uh, in this agency. We have no money. My rent is due today. We haven't got paid yet. Hey, that's my kiss. Uh, you know, it stresses me out. If there was something I can fix in my life, would be going back to school. I would go back to school and give my kids a role model 
of, you know, this is what I did, this is what I've done, I've gone here because I've worked hard, I went to school, I did it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Only one in four low-wage workers have more than a high school education. 46-year-old Robert Nichols used to run a profitable construction business in Las Vegas. His life took a dramatic turn after his divorce in 1998. Okay, you guys, bedtime. I filed for divorce four times in 13 years. It wasn't till the fourth time that I finally went through with it, because there comes a point where you have to decide to cut your losses and start over, and who's really getting damaged here, you know? Sleep tight. Okay. All right. Love you. I love you, too. You think? Robert gained custody of his three children, 17-year-old Sherry, 9-year-old Brittany, and 8-year-old Robert. They left the family home and moved to a motel for three months. I had already called shelters, and the shelters are designed for women, battered women, not men. So I couldn't go there. At first, Robert tried to run his contracting business from the motel, but he soon realized his children needed a full-time parent. At the time, we had five different jobs going, and I was doing as much of the work I could from this little apartment, bringing it home, you know, everything that's involved in running a business. It was a real challenge, and it was extremely nerve-wracking. I lost 30 pounds from stress and got a head full of gray hair. <laughs> Robert now drives a limousine and makes less than $10,000 a year. I came to the realization that I, I couldn't raise these kids properly and still continue with this career. Decided that I needed to be home with them to give them the love and the attention and the nurturing that they needed. 75% of single parent families with two or more children have incomes that fall below the minimum subsistence level. On the surface, it may seem as if the average working person in America is doing better than ever. The 2000 census results reported that the average household income in the United States was just over $42,000 a year. Some economists point to these statistics as proof that even poor people are better off now than they were in the past. To be poor in America 100 years ago, you worked brutally hard. You worked maybe seven days a week. You were often on the verge of of, of genuine, if not starvation, severe, serious hunger. You lived in filthy, crowded conditions. That's not so true for even the poor in America today. Let's say that you are unborn spirit. You're in heaven somewhere, and you're told you're going to live a life of poverty, but I will allow you to choose what country you want to be poor in. What country do you think they want to be poor in? They want to be poor in the United States of America because our poor are the most well-off poor in the entire world, and many times our poor are better off than the middle-class people in most countries in the world. Other social critics see a widening gulf between workers and those who employ them. We have an economic culture in which workers are, appear to CEOs only as, quote, labor costs. They're a cost, they're not a contribution. Uh, they're seen as a drain on the enterprise when actually they're the ones that are making it go. In the early 60s, the average CEO made about 15 times as much as his regular frontline employees. Today, that ratio is 500 to one. The middle class has been diminishing and the very rich have been getting a lot richer what you begin to see as a result of that is a lot of cynicism. But investigative reports continues. Robert Nichols and Ronald Rooney strive to support their families on low-wage incomes. Many people in this country were raised with the expectation that they would have more and do better than the generation that came before. Author Barbara Ehrenreich remembers that as the quintessential American ethic. 
All I ever heard was, you know, work hard, work hard, work hard and you'll get ahead, everything will be okay. Trouble is, it, it doesn't work very well anymore. What I was seeing in the low wage workforce is people working as hard as they could to the point of exhaustion and still not making enough to make ends meet. It's called anxiety. You sleep with it, you wake up with it, it's always there. Um, you have to rob Peter to pay Paul, then rob Paul to pay Peter. Even if you're making, let's say, $8 an hour, if you figure a 40-hour week, that's $320 before taxes. That's not enough. I feel poor, but more importantly, I feel embarrassed. After his divorce in 1998, Las Vegas contractor Robert Nichols decided he had to reevaluate his priorities in order to take care of his three children. I had no idea what I was going to do next, but I realized that whatever I did, I probably wouldn't be able to make the money that I was accustomed to. I saw an ad for cab drivers, so I thought, well, I'll try it. I'll apply. And I walked in, and they said, no, we're not going to let you apply for a cab driver. We want you to drive limousine. I thought I'd finally gotten to a place where I'd be making good money and, and, and things were progressing. And then this 9-11 thing hit. We were hard hit after 9-11, there's no doubt. Devastated. I mean, this is the last place anybody really wanted to come. Tourism is down, the conventions are down, and I'm right back to where I was uh, two years ago, behind that eight ball. It may sound like a glamorous occupation, but because they typically carry fewer passengers in a day, limo drivers often earn less than taxi cab drivers. Now, in a typical month, Robert's take-home pay averages less than the minimum wage. I take home about $800 a month. We are on food stamps. My kids have medical insurance through the Nevada Medicaid system. My taxable income last year was $9,500. So yeah, we're poverty, poverty level. I'm on a commission system, and when things are good, things are great. When things are bad, we do without. You just uh, adapt. Robert works the day shift so he can spend time with his children. Weekend, nighttime, limousine drivers make excellent money, but I don't work nights. During the week, I get up every morning at 5 o'clock, get the kids up by 6, get them showered, ready to go, fed, and I take them to school. They get there at 6.45. The time is what's important now. I've got to raise these kids. I have to do it right. It's become my mission. Isn't that your boyfriend? No, that's Mark. Oh, so you got two now. I don't have two. One's my friend, Dad. I love the days when I was making more money. I made sixty to $80,000 a year, lived a good life took nice vacations. Kids wanted for very little, if anything. Uh, new clothes, had insurance, the whole nine yards. Right now, this, this works for me because when I come home, I'm not exhausted. We found that the kind of jobs that people have are what affects them what affects their employer, their commitment, their loyalty, all of those sorts of things. It also affects their kids. It spills over into your mood and your energy when you go home. At first glance, it may not seem as if Ronald Bruni is struggling. He owns his own home in a decent neighborhood. But in order to provide for his wife and three children, he works seven days a week as an in-home health care provider. I probably work 70, 75 hours per week. A typical day for me, I might have four, 
patience to see. It depends because patients expire. Sometimes patients move from town to town. But I usually see three, four patients. And that's what I do every day. I go see three, four patients, and I give them two and a half, three hours, three and a half hours a day. Hey, man. What's going on? Today, Ronald's first job is at the home of Lamar Jones. Lamar is 25 years old. He was left a quadriplegic as the result of a gang shooting in 1994. Ronald has been caring for Lamar for seven years. Since Lamar is incapable of even the most basic functions, Ronald must help him with the kinds of everyday activities most of us take for granted. I uh, brush his teeth. I uh, give him a bed bath. I catheterize him. Then I flip him over, and I put on three pair of gloves, and I do what we call a bowel program. I don't care what you want to put on. This is what we're going to put on today. Legs. Yeah. Ronald has a special affinity with Lamar. He knows that he could have easily wound up in the same condition. I've had a very checkered past. Uh, I was a heroin addict for seven and a half, eight years maybe. I did 37 months, 12 days, uh, four hours in prison. I decided that that life was leading me nowhere. It was leading me right where I was in prison. It was a one-way street, downhill, since his release from prison in 1989, Ronald has vowed to stay clean and sober. I'm a great nurse. I'm a stand-up guy. I'm straight arrow. I don't do drugs. I don't uh, gang bang. I'm not a criminal. I take care of my family. Uh, and in my heart, I'm a decent person. And I know that eventually uh, I will win out. When investigative reports continues, we examine how the playing field has changed for workers like Virginia Perry in the new American economy. What does it mean to be poor in the United States? In the 1960s, the federal government established a cost of living formula to help determine the country's poverty level in order to provide assistance to those in need. But critics say that formula needs to be reevaluated because it doesn't reflect today's economy and how much money people really need to make ends meet. Has the American dream been downsized? Has the gap between rich and poor become a chasm? Our income inequality is much worse than in other developed countries. And this is primarily, this is on both ends. Our higher income families earn much more than higher income families in other countries, and our lower income families earn much less. We have more people who remain in poverty year after year than in any other developed country. I'm not denying that there are poor Americans by our standards, but to be poor in America today is not to be in dire straits. Poverty is a relative concept. During the mid-1960s, President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty to assist people on the bottom tier of American society. In order to identify who was truly needy, policymakers devised a formula to define poverty and set minimum subsistence guidelines. The poverty guidelines were set up back in the early 1960s and are based on food consumption. Back then, food was about one-third of family budgets, and so they took the basic food budget developed by the Department of Agriculture and multiplied it by three and have just projected it forward using the rate of inflation. When adjusted for inflation, food costs have remained relatively stable over four decades. And what were once luxury items have become affordable to many. But the relative price for the basics, housing and health care, has skyrocketed, pushing low-income budgets to the edge. So the squeeze is worse now than it was 20 years ago because there's this pincer between the wage being frozen on the one side and the cost of living going up on the other side. Some social critics say the cost of living equation is out of step with what most people need to make ends meet. In Las Vegas, Nevada, Virginia Perry struggles to get by on her $7.25 per hour wage job. I work at a dry cleaners. I do counter work is what I do. 
I do the cash register, I mark in clothes, and I deal with all the customers. I make uh, $7.25 per hour and I get paid bi-weekly. And most of the time I'll bring home maybe $500 or sometimes a little over depending on how my hours run. I'm good at my job, I feel. I get along with the customers. I have a lot of customers that, you know, like me and will deal with me. It, this is of importance. My You're leaving it in your pocket. Thank you. I love to go to work. I love it. But my roughest part is when I have to work nights and I don't get home until 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night on the bus. It, that's my roughest part. Virginia enjoys her work, but she would like to move up the economic ladder. I've been there for almost a year and a half, and I'm not moving anywhere. I don't want us to stay as a counter person. I want to move up. I want to become manager. I think they make $10 an hour as manager. I'd be a lot better money than what I'm making now. A $2.75 an hour raise would be about an extra $100 a week after taxes. Still, Virginia would have to struggle to make ends meet. But for her and Justin, even a baby step is progress. I want to do it by myself. I can prove to the society that even though I make little money, obviously I'm doing it now and I can still do it. Some insist the rules of supply and demand should set wages, not need. In fact, many believe that even setting a minimum wage can work against the interests of the poor by making American labor too expensive and driving low-wage jobs overseas. Most economists believe that the minimum wage statute unquestionably causes unemployment. It's anti-poor and anti-black and anti-minority, anti-low-skilled and unskilled workers because it prices those people out of the labor market. I think that the stockholders and the board of directors of a corporation make the decisions about salaries as opposed to having some governmental agency do it. A corporation's responsibility is to their shareholders and their customers, nobody else. The decline of unionized industries since the 1960s has had a significant impact on wages. In the 1950s, about 35% of all jobs were unionized, and that set prevailing wages, not just for autos and steel and chemicals, but for a large percentage of our industrial base. But now, all of that very large manufacturing base that used to be the foundation stone of our middle class uh, is, uh, well, it's, it's just in the process of shrinking. As manufacturing jobs have moved overseas, they've been replaced with lower wage jobs in the service sector. During that time, a new industry emerged and took a page from the past to rewrite the future of the American workplace. One of the great innovations that the McDonald brothers came up with at their hamburger bar in 1948 in San Bernardino, California, the first McDonald's, was instead of having skilled short order cooks, they brought uh, Henry Ford's assembly line system, the factory system, to the back of the restaurant kitchen. In his book, Fast Food Nation, Eric Schlosser critiques this low paid, revolving door work environment and claims that it has become an occupational paradigm for American business. The key to understanding a fast food workforce is low wages, no benefits, high turnover rate, and as few skills among the workers as possible. Over 11 and a half million Americans work in the restaurant industry. But according to Schlosser, many fast food employees don't stay around long enough to qualify for benefits, raises, or promotions. Restaurant industry executives, however, see the business as an opportunity for unskilled workers. People can come into a restaurant job, at least at the entry level position, uh, with relatively little or no skills. And then we can teach them skills and they might stay in that uh, career for a long time or they may leave it after uh, a few months or a few years and move on to uh, a career in some other field. But Schlosser claims that fast food industry executives are not interested in building a skilled workforce. I went to a fast food convention where some of the leading executives all agreed on one point. 
uh, the ultimate goal of this industry, they said, was zero training. Well, I think he's putting a lot of responsibility on the restaurant industry for something that's really occurring in the economy as a whole. Schlosser notes that the minimum wage's real purchasing power has declined 27 percent at the same time the fast food industry has exploded. As other companies and other industries throughout the service sector saw how profitable McDonald's was uh, through this labor system, they imitated it. And when you don't pay people well, when you don't really give them any meaningful say in what their job involves, and you don't mind when they quit after six months or seven months, uh, you have a, a kind of a rootless, alienated workforce. How have working conditions changed for low-wage employees? The adoption of the 40-hour work week was one of the great victories of the 20th century labor movement. But in today's economy, a 40-hour work week may seem like a luxury. When Investigative Reports returns, Sandra Gale Hurst works two jobs to support her family. In the 1930s, a generation fought hard to win the 40-hour work week. But some say it's no longer possible to get by on what a low-wage earner makes in 40 hours. I think working 40 hours a week today is increasingly a luxury to only work that much. If what I found is true, that you can't really do it on one of these jobs, you have to have more than one of these jobs. And typically, uh, I was seeing people who would have an eight-hour job and then a six-hour job on top of that, maybe even two full-time jobs. While the United States Census reports that fewer than 6% of workers hold more than one job, author Barbara Ehrenreich says the people she met while working as an hourly employee make those numbers sound low. Well, if it's only a small percentage of people who work two jobs, I must have met all of them then, because it was just so common among the people I worked alongside. A lot of people can't afford to work just 40 hours a week. They, they have to work, uh, say, 60, even 80 hours a week. The federal minimum wage currently stands at 5.15 an hour. Even people who earn more than that can be challenged by the cost of living in America. But many economists look at what low-income budgets are buying and see the challenges as being self-imposed. I don't think people with less income find it more difficult to make it in the society. I think for them it's easier to make it. Now, I'm not speaking psychologically. I'm not a psychologist. I can't, I can't analyze the way they feel psychologically about having less income than Bill Gates or a bond trader or a college professor. But in fact, as our society progresses, as the market system that we have continues to work, even the poor get better and better off by almost all measures that I would regard as meaningful. Our poor people have televisions, color televisions, microwaves, air conditioners, cell phones, and many times middle-class uh, people in other parts of the world don't have this. Low-wage workers in America may be able to afford consumer goods like cell phones and televisions, but basic needs like health care and housing are often outside their reach. In Loxley, Alabama, Sandra Gale Hurst works two jobs to keep afloat. In the mornings, she's a school cafeteria worker in nearby Daphne. When she was in high school, Sandra Gale planned on being a nutritionist, but she put her career plans on hold after she got married and became pregnant. When I'm serving on the line, I'm always making them eat their vegetables. So you gotta have five servings of vegetables a day, get it. Most of them do do it, because you know, somebody's saying something. I love my job. Yeah, I do. I like working for the school system, and I love working for Daphne High in particular. So. What do you want, cheese fries? Hey. Regular? 75 cents worth, two? It's like a family instead of like, um, you know, a job job. I prepare the main menu. If we have beefaroni, I prepare that. If we're having sandwiches, I prepare the meat for the sandwiches. San Rigel takes home $233.33 every two weeks from her job at the high school. Her second job at the Guardian Angels Daycare Center adds an extra $40 to $50 weekly. Are you trying to dance? Hmm? I work at the daycare. I worked there for going on three years this August. A fringe benefit of the daycare job for Sandra is that her three-year-old son 
attends the center where she works. I'm the mother, a single mother of two children, um, a little girl, a little boy. I got to work, plus, you know, catch little glimpses of them growing up a little bit. I didn't totally miss it all, like a lot of working parents do. Um, I go in and do what they need done. Um, I like to do it because I'm with my son. You know, if I want to poke my head in there and say, hey, I can. Come here, baby boy. <laughs> Have you been ugly? Give mommy a hug. <laughs> I don't want nobody to take care of me. I do it myself. No. I do. No. Pride will be your downfall. <laughs> I've heard that a lot lately. I get by. I make it. Ian Levison may appreciate the ring of hope in Sandra Gale's voice, but he believes that low wage jobs can be a dead end street. Since he graduated from Villanova University in 1991, Levison has held 43 low-wage jobs. His experiences inspired him to write A Working Stiff's Manifesto, an account of his life as one of the working poor. I think after you've worked a certain number of low-level jobs, if you don't succeed fairly early on in your, in your working life, you're probably not going to. And, you know, as, as your bills start accumulating, it sucks the optimism out of you. And it wears you down. Author Barbara Ehrenreich agrees that low-wage workers can get caught in an endless cycle of dead-end jobs. I think low-wage jobs are a trap um, in all the ways that they used to say welfare was a trap, that you can get into this and you can't easily get out, or, and it may be that your children don't get out of it. There is an impressive recent study showing that the lower the wages of the parents, the more likely the child is to have trouble in school, be suspended, be held back. I mean, it's a direct correlation. While it may be difficult to break out of the poverty cycle, some observers insist that low-wage workers should take responsibility for their situation. These were all personal choices. That is, the person voluntarily dropped out of school. Nobody made them drop out of school. The person voluntarily had more kids than they could support. Nobody forced them to have kids. They, they made their own situation, and they are responsible for it. Not me and not you, but they themselves. Statistics say that 40% of Americans are two paychecks away from homelessness. When we return, how Virginia Perry and Sophia Acosta fight for space in today's housing market. The percentage of people who own their own homes is one of the measurements of a nation's economic health. Three decades ago, when homes cost about twice a typical family's yearly income, buying a house was a predictable step in many American lives. Today, home ownership is less of a sure thing for the hourly wage worker. Unprecedented growth in home values, coupled with homeowner tax breaks, such as the mortgage interest deduction, have had an impact on the ability of low-income Americans to find housing. Out of, out of my paycheck, I would use three quarters of it for rent. The rents are phenomenal. The rents are just outrageous. Uh, you, they're not, uh, you spend practically all of your paycheck on just paying rent, and then you have utilities, and you have food, and you're raising a kid. All of my money goes to housing. Recreation is a uh, luxury. Medical is a luxury. In my experience, for many people I talked to, that I worked with, um, housing was the biggest concern all the time. You know, rents have just skyrocketed in the last decade or so, while wages have remained pretty flat. If you're earning $7 an hour, which is $1,100 a month, before taxes, and you're facing rents for 500 or 600 or even more a month, there's not much left <laughs> after rent. As the housing market heats up and homes are more valuable, it hurts the little guy who is a renter because the rents also are likely to go up. Now, usually when the price of something goes up, you create more supply. 
The housing market doesn't work like that. One woman I worked with was sharing a hotel room. Uh, it really, it was a kind of a flop house hotel room with a man who she was friendly with, but not involved with. And that was okay financially until he started hitting on her. And then she had to get out of that situation uh, and sleep in her truck. One of the difficulties low-wage workers face in finding affordable housing is coming up with a security deposit for an apartment or a down payment for a house. For 23-year-old Virginia Perry and her son, home is a motel room they share with her mother and stepfather in Las Vegas. Virginia and Justin moved into the motel after she and her husband separated. Virginia Perry thought the motel would be temporary. It hasn't worked out that way. Made it over there. It's my home. It's been my home for three years, so it, it doesn't bother me. Sometimes it does because I don't have anywhere to like just go and be alone for a while. Instead, I have to, you know, just sit where I have to sit and stay where I have to stay. Virginia would like to have her own place, but has found it difficult to get an apartment on the money she earns working at a local dry cleaner. She brings home around $260 a week. A lot of times they want a lot of money down just to move in there, and then they run your credit check. If your credit check's not very good, then you still have to pay that outrageous amount to move in there, and it's like uh, trying to save up for all of that. It's very hard. I would like to either move into an apartment or find something bigger and better. I want more for my son. I don't, I don't want to live here all my life. But it's difficult right now, especially paying for childcare weekly and food and rent and paying for bus fares back and forth. It gets a little rough sometimes. Hello, Sophia. Hi. How are you? Okay. Rent, rent? Yes, I am. Sophia Acosta lives in a rough neighborhood in North Miami. She does it because it means she can make the 45-minute bus ride to work without changing buses. But there are trade-offs. Crime is a constant threat. That happens very often. There's some trouble kids that come around the neighborhood. There was a, a neighbor that was thrown out of this, this complex because of the problems they caused. But the kids still hang around here. They still hang around here. They, they're always looking for trouble. And cops are always around the area just because of this, because you don't know what could happen. You know, there could be a shootout, or I mean, you know, there's so many kids living here. You know, so I try to stay in, indoors. You know, I don't try to stay out. <laughs> I try to stay out there late. With a monthly take home of nearly $1,240, Sophia earns more than many low wage workers. But $1,240 doesn't go as far in Miami as it might in other places. Over half of Sophia's take-home pay goes for rent. She pays $675 a month to live in a 700-square-foot apartment. I do feel ripped off when I, you know, what I'm paying now because it's a small apartment, it's too crowded. I mean, it's small even for me and my son. And for the price I'm paying, it's, it's not worth it. The National Housing Conference recently reported that nearly 50% of low-wage workers pay more than half their monthly income for the most basic place to live. Getting into even a low-end apartment can require a sizable investment. Once security deposits, utility startup costs, and other fees are factored in. When you ask people to live in inadequate housing and without the child care and health care and food that they need, that's, that's violence being committed. I would call that class warfare of a very serious kind. For the working poor, life is an uphill battle, a constant struggle to pay bills, buy food, and support their families. But despite the odds stacked against them, the men and women we've been following tonight share a positive outlook on their jobs and their future. When we return with the second hour of Investigative Reports, We'll learn about the survival techniques our low-wage workers use 
to make ends meet here on A&E. A limo driver, receptionist, and in-home health care provider. They are among the millions of low-wage workers in the United States who are struggling to get by. But how do those numbers really add up? Is it really a living wage? Tonight, in the second hour of this special edition of Investigative Reports, we resume our journey across America as we profile five low-wage families. They come from different backgrounds, but share similar dreams of pursuing a better life, a life beyond poverty. In a country where it seems everyone drinks bottled water and carries a cell phone, it may be hard to believe that 77 million Americans live in near poverty. The poor have become the invisible class in today's society. And I don't want to overly dramatize it, but we are drifting apart into very separate worlds where the poor don't see much of the rich and the rich really don't see very much of the poor. One quarter of American workers earn less than $8 an hour, around $300 a week. Some social critics say these people, the so-called working poor, are trapped in an endless cycle of low-wage jobs. Investigative reports set out to explore the world of the low-wage worker. If someone said a low-wage worker doesn't work very hard, you'd be a maid for a day. You go out and pick the strawberries in the field for a day, and that will show you hard work. That's the hardest work I have ever done. The biggest challenge would be, uh, in my mind, is supporting my daughter, my youngest daughter, 16 months old. Um, personally, I feel like I'm letting her down. In order to make it, you have to piece jobs together uh, because one job doesn't pay enough to relax. America is a nation that worships success. Where Cinderella, rags to riches stories define our can-do culture. But some social observers say not everyone can do. We have this kind of tendency uh, in, in America, if people don't make it, to say, well, it's their fault, something about them, some problem about them, they didn't try hard enough, they have some deficiency. That is just not the case in terms of the overall picture. I've heard middle class people say, well, the trouble with the poor is they can't manage money. But if you look at, you know, $1,100 a month, take out, uh, say, 400 for rent and 400 for childcare, that's 800 out of 1,100. There's nothing left to manage. A common survival strategy among the working poor is a kind of bill paying roulette, meeting some essential obligations while letting others slide. Although he once earned as much as $80,000 a year as a construction manager, Robert Nichols makes only a fraction of that now. After going through a divorce, he switched to a less time-consuming job so he could be a hands-on father to his three children. Robert now works as a limousine driver in Las Vegas. Even with state assistance, he has to juggle his bills to support his family. I'm always jostling bills from one month to the next to keep the lights on, keep the gas on, get the rent paid. Every month is different. This month, the electric bill will probably be astronomical, but we'll be sitting here sweating and dealing with that too, I have no doubt. To supplement his family's food budget, Robert receives food stamps from the government. Robert must document his income and expenses. If he earns too much or economizes too well, his benefits get cut. This food stamps is a necessary evil in my family. Last six months, I was allotted $341 a month in food stamps, which is a tough thing for four people. My dad just does a lot more than two people can handle. You know, he is the mom, he is the dad, he is the the winner, the breadwinner, and he takes care of so much. Sherry says her little sister and brother don't really remember when the family had more. For her, it's been a bigger adjustment. 
I can't do as many social things as, you know, I, I could before. Sometimes it's like, uh, you know, I want to rip out my hair. I want to be a careless teenager that I, I'm not. But I don't, I don't blame my dad. Keeping the little things the same kind of help keep everything in balance as far as our perspective on our financial situation. By pinching pennies and clipping coupons, Robert can sometimes offer his family a few modest luxuries. Going to, to uh, Supercuts to get my hair cut, it's something we've always done since we were little. This is a nice thing, too. You get 10 haircuts, the 11th one's 40, which helps with three kids, I'll tell you. On occasion, I've run into some, some old acquaintances, uh, people that I've worked with. They're usually surprised to see how I've changed occupations. It's a humbling experience, but in order to take care of my children, I'll do whatever it takes. He is my hero, definitely. My dad is, yeah, he's a hero. He's a super dad. I'm, I'm not a hero. I'm just a father. And I can't imagine anybody doing any less than what I'm doing. You don't have to change the way you look or be able to write a book. That's not the way I look. That's not Take your time and just do it. And remember the word. You can, you, can just, you can just glance at it and see the words that rhyme. Ronald Rooney and his wife Lisa have three children. In addition, they care for Lisa's 14-year-old niece. Lisa works at home as a full-time mother. She and Ronald have had to struggle to make ends meet on the money he makes as an in-home care provider. I'm supporting myself, my wife, and the four kids. Uh, and I make six seventy-five an hour. I'm really good with the dollar bill. Um, one of the things I do is try to live within my means. Uh, it's very simple to me. Very, very uncomplex. You pay for two packs, but you get three packs. I try to buy as little fast food as I can buy. I cook. Um, I cook every day, three meals a day, and it saves a lot of money. Um, the furniture we have now, um, we have not bought a new piece of furniture in probably 14 years. Because if we see the dominoes, we will win. Once in a while, we go to a movie, once in a while. And my wife likes to go to Chuck E. Cheese. So if, um, if I get a few extra bucks, uh, she takes the kids to Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, because I don't think I would do that one. I feel badly that uh, I can't take the kids to Disneyland. Uh, I can't take my son to all the Laker games. Um, my salary does not allow me to do a lot of things like that. And uh, I just take a deep breath, and then I say to myself, keep fighting, Ron, keep fighting. Be a straight guy, be a stand-up guy, and eventually I'll earn the money that I should be earning and everything will be okay. Here, hold it over your shoulder like this, just like I got it. Over your back, yeah. Okay. The working poor live a life of chronic shortfall, but hope is a commodity that comes without a price tag. I think some people do hold on to uh, the idea that they could do better or that their children might do better. Uh, and I'm surprised really at how resilient and hopeful many people are. For Sandra Gale Hurst, faith that things will work out seems to trump the starker reality. Sandra Gale works two jobs in Loxley, Alabama in order to support herself and her two children. Even with two jobs, however, she lives paycheck to paycheck. With a budget as tight as Sandra Gale's, saving is an unaffordable luxury. If something unexpected popped up, what would I do? Pray. Pray and cry and kick and scream. <laughs> Probably in that order. You just deal with it. Stuff happens all the time, you know? It's not any different for me than it is for anybody else, except, you know, sometimes I don't have a lot of money. There's a lot of people out there that don't have it. No, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good this week, you know, I got $42 in the bank. <laughs> but the thing is, I haven't paid bills yet. Sandra Gale's daughter Priscilla turned eight on May 19th. 
And even though she knew it was coming, the party threw Sandra Gale's finances into chaos. Birthday. Ooh, that's why I'm behind now. Priscilla's birthday was the 19th. And, you know, I gave her a little party. You know, $20 for a cake, you know, $12 for a present, you know. That's a lot of money to me, you know. Something to suffer, but I'll get it. I'll skip the telephone bill a month. And <laughs> I know that's a bad mentality to have, but when you're low on money, that's what kind of mentality you end up getting. There is a lot of evidence in the research that how mothers feel about themselves affects how they parent. If you're feeling really crummy, burned out, stressed out at the end of the day, that, that spills right over into how you treat your kids. When author Barbara Ehrenreich set out in search of minimum wage America, she anticipated hearing some outrage from low-wage workers. What she found instead were hard-working people who were too defeated to think about changing their situations. I didn't realize how locked in you can get to a job by transportation problems and childcare problems, for example, or by the simple fact that you might miss a week's pay or even two weeks' pay, which could be a total disaster. Sophia Acosta tries to break out of the cycle of dead-end employment and move up the economic ladder, searching for a better job when we return. Over the last several decades, jobs that paid even unskilled workers more than $15 an hour moved out of the U.S. and went to foreign markets. Few of the jobs that replaced them offer the same kind of earning opportunity. Author Barbara Ehrenreich spent nearly two years exploring the world of the low-wage worker, getting an inside look at the life of a wage slave. She discovered it was difficult for a low-wage worker to get off the treadmill of dead-end jobs. Sometimes I would get a little frustrated with some of my coworkers, thinking, you know, you've got to go out and search for a better job than this. this there's got to be something better. 30, 40 years ago, there were many more jobs that you could get without a college education uh, that could support a family. Those jobs have been eliminated. They've gone overseas. So you don't want to lose a job and start again. Looking for a job can be very hard if you don't have transportation and you don't have childcare. Okay, thank you. Sophia Acosta, a single mother with three children, already has a job at this Miami mental health agency, but she's looking for a different one. She says working for a nonprofit organization is too financially uncertain. When everyone asks me, are we getting paid? Are we getting paid today? So I have to go up there and you know ask. Sometimes, are we gonna? Are they gonna pay us today? Or you know, and then they tell me, and then I have to like spread the word. In other words, they don't want to tell anybody else, but just myself, and then I'm gonna tell everybody else whether we're gonna get paid or not. It's very stressful. Sophia has been looking for a better paying job for three months. I've been sending out my resume. I've been going to a few interviews. I've been searching in the internet, you know, um, uh, into the job search in there, and I found a few jobs that require my, you know, my uh, experience of receptionist, front desk, clerical, I'm an you know, administrative assistant. She spends at least an hour each day looking at the help wanted ads. Um, this one pays uh, $10 to $15 an hour, which is a big difference of what I'm making now. <laughs> okay, hasta mañana. It would mean a whole lot because it'll at least help me, you know, have a little money extra besides, you know, after paying my rent and paying my bills, I can have a little extra maybe to save or, you know, doing something for myself. One time I went to, uh, to Red Lobster. I liked it that. I afforded that. It was pretty good. So it's, you know, that was one of my biggest extravagant things. Sophia once held a job in the collections department of a New York bank. An irony she recognizes now that bill collectors call her. I didn't know what it was having a person behind you constantly, you know, like, you know, asking you, you got to pay, you got to pay, you got to pay. You know, I didn't know what was that like until after, you know, we got divorced. Then I was doing it all on my own. Then I said, well, you know, now I understand how they felt when, when I was the one that was calling them constantly. 
Sophia finds a listing for a better paying job, but it is short term. And in the current recession, she is afraid to take a chance. This is a temporary job. They're paying 25,000 a year, but it's, it's not a permanent position. It's only temp. I don't want to go into any temp position because I don't know how, you know, if it's, if it's going to be a, a long term thing. It's not, you know, I don't want to risk it and then say, well, I'm, I'm without a job again. We have a alcohol and Being out of a job is something Sophia cannot afford. So she keeps looking. Six, Author Barbara Ehrenreich says that despite employers' claims that good help is hard to find, good jobs are even harder to find. A lot of companies will uh, have uh, help wanted ads, uh, but when you go there, they just take your application form. They're really not interested in talking to you or anything. So they're just building up a, uh, a stack of application forms to keep, so they can call on new people as the turnover continues. Sandra Gale Hurst has held half a dozen jobs in the past 10 years. I never wanted to stay out of work for long, but I worked at a plastic corporation. Hot work, you know, no air conditioner in there. People would get sick from the heat during the summertime. After she left the job at the plastics factory, Sandra Gale worked for a temporary agency and then for an airplane manufacturer. They wanted me to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day. I have two kids <laughs> raising them. I can't work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. My kids wouldn't have any time. They wouldn't even see me. Unable to juggle a demanding work schedule, Sandra Gale left the job after just a few months. So I started waitressing, and I couldn't handle the conditions of the restaurant. I couldn't do it. You know, I'm sorry. I just have a problem trying to serve somebody food when they have a dead rat under the table. <laughs> but, you know, so much for my little problems I have. <laughs> For many, low-wage jobs become a revolving door. Employees move laterally from workplace to workplace, but find it hard to climb to the next level of compensation. I think the attitude of management seems to be that labor is a renewable resource. Just use it up one batch and then you get another one. Ronald Rooney takes pride in his job, but he feels his work is undervalued. I don't feel I make enough money for what I do. I'm a home care provider making $6.75 an hour. Ron is paid by the state of California as an independent contractor. Terrible. As such, he has to cover his own expenses and doesn't get any benefits. The Department of Social Services, they do not pay you for gas, oil, wear and tear on your car. They don't pay you for holidays. You don't get paid overtime, time and a half, double time, holidays. None of that do you get. I think people who are better off in a, in a different uh, uh, financial status, in a higher financial status, they, they look down on me uh, because of the job I do. But uh, that doesn't matter to me because I, I'm doing what I need to do to get money to take care of my family. When we return, low-wage workers fight for better conditions in the workplace. Many low-wage workers complain that today's workplace is a stressful environment in which they're subjected to drug testing, round-the-clock surveillance, and shifting and unpredictable schedules. And some low-wage workers are even taking America's largest retailer to court over issues of unpaid work. America's largest employers of minimum wage workers are huge corporations. Some of these companies insist that applicants submit to a psychological profile before they get hired. Most of these jobs you have to take a personality test before you can get in the door. And a lot of the questions are pretty silly. I don't know how anybody could get them wrong, like the one of the ones I encountered on a number of companies' tests uh, says, um, quote, in, in the past year I have stolen parentheses, check dollar amount below worth of goods from my employers. Well, you know how to answer that one. They wanted to know exactly how old you were, how many kids you had, uh, how many times you've been married, so on and so forth. Uh, where do you live? What kind of uh, community you're associated with? Many, many different questions that may or may not really have been their business. One office went, went to apply for a job. I purposely uh, did not answer those questions, and as soon as the uh, interviewer 
uh, came to get my application. All of those unanswered questions were circled in red. Some employees also complain that the modern workplace is a dehumanizing environment, subject to round-the-clock surveillance. The hardest thing for me to deal with in these jobs was, was not the work, although that was very hard, but it was a sense of being under surveillance all the time from management, uh, being distrusted, uh, being suspected, as everybody was, of being a thief or um, a drug addict or an alcoholic. But that's the feeling you get. In normal life, you have rights as a, as a citizen, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, all those things you check at the door when you go to work at so many low-wage jobs. You have no rights to privacy. Uh, very early on in one of my first jobs, a fellow worker warned me. She said, watch out what you have in your purse because the boss can search it at any time. Each year, it's estimated that as many as 25 million job seekers and current employees undergo drug testing to be considered for employment or to keep their jobs. I find the, uh, the drug testing insulting on several levels. It's a, a violation of my Fourth Amendment right to freedom from an unwarranted search. It, you know, it's sometimes conducted in a way that is somewhat embarrassing. Another employee concern is privacy on the job. Surveillance cameras are everywhere. Theft on the job is a legitimate concern. But according to the National Work Rights Institute, surveillance in the workplace should have some limits. If they only use cameras where there was solid evidence of misconduct, they probably would get something most of the time. But where the employer's first response is to put in the camera, most of the time they're going to find nothing. Some employers have put hidden cameras in locker rooms, bathrooms, shower facilities, places where there just should never, ever be a camera. The limits of this kind of surveillance were put to the test when a Boston hotel placed a hidden camera where previously no cameras had been allowed. There was a rumor that somebody was smoking pot in the men's locker room. The very first thing they did was to put a hidden camera in the locker room and secretly videotape 100 employees taking their clothes off. The local hotel workers union found out about the surveillance when a waitress found a videotape that had been left behind by a security guard. The union filed suit against the hotel, arguing that the surveillance had been an invasion of privacy and that there had been no evidence that any employee was doing drugs. There is no videotape of anybody smoking pot, selling pot, or doing anything else wrong. The only thing that is on any of those videotapes are innocent employees taking their clothes off. They probably could have gotten to the bottom of the problem some other way, but they didn't even bother to try. And that's the problem. That's a very typical example of the kind of thing that goes wrong. Being watched on the job is one controversial issue. Another legal battle has surfaced concerning workplace conditions at America's largest retailer. Recently, Walmart became embroiled in a number of individual and class action suits in 28 states charging that some Walmart store managers may have forced employees to work off the clock for no pay. At first, I was kind of shocked, but then as uh, by the work environment and the work rules, as you know, the duration of my employment continued, it just got to the borderline of absurdity. Issues of the overtime, the working through your breaks, the not getting a break, the having to stay over, the having to come in early, take a two-hour lunch break so you don't get 41 hours this week. We had to come in for mandatory meetings. Actually, we had to sign a piece of paper just to sign in, not clock in, and we only got paid for the hour that we were there instead of four hours, which is mandatory. The store closes, let's say, at 10. So the managers lock the doors, and they leave. And so the overnight people have to wait for the morning manager to come in at 6 AM to let them out. They're like, you're staying. We don't care. You're, you know, you're doing this. And right around the holidays, it would always intensify more so due to the fact that uh, they were short staffed. If somebody works more than 40 hours, uh, they are entitled to overtime. If you do work for the benefit of your employer, you are entitled to be paid for that work. You know, things add up very quickly, so if you miss half of a break, you might think it's unfair, you might think it's unjust, but you may not know that it's illegal. Walmart did not return our phone calls inviting them to talk about their corporate policies on camera. 
But in published reports, the company has defended its employment practices, saying that worker accusations of uncompensated time on the job are vastly overstated. When we return, the effect of welfare reform on the working poor and the push for a living wage. Many of those who joined the working poor did so when a sweeping reform of government policy ended what was called welfare as we know it. In 1996, welfare was replaced with something called TENF, temporary assistance to needy families. Under TENF, applicants would be turned away if they were unwilling to go to work. Benefits like food stamps and child care assistance would only be made available for five years. The idea was to change the culture of dependency. There came to be this backlash by people who said over and over again, the problem in America is welfare. Too many people staying on welfare for too long a period of time. What welfare does, or handout programs do, they created a certain level of irresponsibility over uh, among a large percentage of black Americans. And I think that that is tragic. Welfare has done to black Americans what slavery could not have done, what the Jim Crow and Reconstruction could not have done, namely destroy the black family and cause all kinds of social pathology. The one guarantee of poverty and a lifetime of poverty is to stay in welfare. That is, if you don't work and you're on welfare, you're going to be poor. And if you work at an eight, ten, nine, ten dollar an hour job full time, for most family configurations, you have now escaped poverty. Welfare reform is basically uh, a social experiment. And before welfare reform was passed, there were cries on all sides about what this was going to do. The people who were against welfare reform predicted that it was going to be very detrimental to children and families. The people who were for it predicted that it was going to be very helpful, that self-sufficiency was very important. I got into this because of welfare reform. I was kind of fascinated by the assumption that you could just get a job and then you'd be lifted out of poverty, you and your family. And it just didn't look to me like it would work because I could see what the wages were in my local newspaper that were being offered and I could see what the rents were. The math didn't look good. I think that one of the things we wanted to look at is actually look at the data. What does the data tell us? Uh, it's hard to argue that there's more poverty when there's less poverty. It's hard to argue that more children are living below the poverty line when, in fact, less children are living below the poverty line. It's hard to argue that fewer single-parent heads of households are employed when, in fact, more are employed. So there are some very good and encouraging signs about the impact of welfare reform, but we don't think we have it perfect yet. Well, they've gotten jobs, haven't they? However, they have found employment at average wages of uh, just about $7 an hour, which is exactly what I was uh, finding out there. And there's reason to believe that for many of them, their lives have not improved. To acknowledge that low-wage work doesn't lift people out of poverty would be very difficult for our political leaders. And then they would have to acknowledge also that welfare reform may have been a catastrophic mistake. The jury is still out, but we're beginning to get some evidence about what's happening, particularly to children and families. And the picture is pretty mixed, as usual. People want the one magic, you know, answer. But in fact, the, the, the messages are, are more complicated than that. The people who were early on advocating for welfare reform said to families, get a job, get any job. But the kind of job that families get and whether or not that job can really move you out of poverty is a much more important issue. Oftentimes, when folks move from welfare into the labor market, they become ineligible for a whole host of other subsidies that were really holding them up. The cost that they have to pay for their public housing will increase dramatically. They may uh, not receive their food stamps. They're likely to be kicked off of Medicaid. So that safety net is, is really gone for low-income working families. Some low-wage workers refuse to use that safety net, even when it's offered. I don't think that I should have the government send me a check every month because I decided to have two children. It wasn't their decision, it was my decision. 
Sandra Gale Hurst is ambivalent about assistance. Her rent is subsidized and her kids get Alabama state health insurance, but she gets angry at people who, quote, ride the system. I'm not trying to suck the government. I'm not riding the government. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, when you go to try to get help like that, that that's their mentality, you know, like, here comes another one, you know, somebody else to suck the government. And it's, you know, and I know they probably do deal with people that do that, but not everybody's like that, and they shouldn't use that mentality on everybody. If you're getting assistance, you should not be walking around in name brand clothes if they can get, you know, two or three hundred dollars worth of food stamps a month, but they can afford Nikes and Fila's and all those K-Swiss shoes for their kids two or three pairs a month. Does not make sense to me. Every family communicates differently. I'm glad they have the programs that helps us. It shouldn't be something I'm, you know, you're on all the time. When I'm getting ready for bed, I normally think mostly how how to how to become better, how to you know, like make it. My biggest regret in life is separating from my husband and not finishing school. Even though her $1,100 a month income as a worker at a Las Vegas dry cleaner makes her eligible for assistance, Virginia Perry pays out of her own pocket for her son's daycare. I pay $117.50 a week for my son's school. <laughs> That's a lot of money, a whole lot of money. The one that I take just into, it's close to my work and it's 24 hours, so that's why I choose that one. My other one's 6 o'clock, got to come and get them. My hours are different, so that one works great. Spending about $470 a month for Justin's daycare means there's no money for a car. So Virginia and her five-year-old son ride the bus, even when she has to work late and can't get Justin home until nearly midnight. When I pick him up, he's already asleep. And so I'll carry him a little ways, and then he'll be kind of waking up because of the cars and me walking outside with him. He'll, and I'll make him walk a little bit. I mean, I don't want to, but I have to because he gets too heavy for me to carry. And then we sit at the bus stop, and he'll kind of fall back to sleep. And then when we get on the bus, he'll fall asleep. And then we just walk. We get off the bus and come back here. Love you. If it wasn't for Justin, I think I probably would lose it a lot of times. But he's like my stronger power. He helps me constantly. Just thinking about him or seeing him every day just makes my day better. According to the U.S. Department of Human Services, only 12% of needy families get assistance for child care. Virginia says in her case, red tape is to blame. I applied for assistance on daycare and then they put me on a waiting list when my name came up the lady had called me and told me that they would send me paperwork i waited two weeks for the paperwork they never sent it i called and all i keep doing is getting the runaround so why put myself through the runaround when i would just rather do it on my own some of the working poor claim that the cost of basic necessities cannot be met by a minimum wage the food assistance organization Second Harvest reports that requests at food pantries are up since 1996. In recent years, low-wage workers and their advocates across the country have lobbied for a living wage, an hourly minimum wage that reflects the real cost of living. The living wage varies from city to city, but it is designed to guarantee that a working family will be earning at least a subsistence level income. Today, over 80 communities and cities, including Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, have living wage laws. That's disgusting! Union busting! What's they got the money. Wages, and they have to pay us, family. But until May 2001, one of Cambridge's most visible and wealthy employers, Harvard University, was paying some of its custodial, security, and food service workers considerably less than the local $10.25 living wage. Frank Morley has worked as a custodian at Harvard since 1997. In five years on the job, he's had two weeks of vacation. There was a time when I was working 77 hours a week, 
I would work from 7.30 to 4 here at Harvard, go back to Mansfield where I live. I would work from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. a night in the supermarket out there five days a week. I wasn't doing better financially 20 years ago than I'm doing now. Their attitude, uh, you say janitor, well, anybody can do that work. You don't need any training or uh, schooling or anything else to do that. You can bring anybody in to do that. And they find out sometimes that's not quite the case. You do have to know a little something. They look at it strictly in terms of dollars and cents. They don't look at it too much in human terms. And I don't think they're really too concerned with the human terms anyway. In 1998, a group of students started a campaign to implement a living wage on campus. More than 2,000 low-wage workers formed an unlikely alliance with the students whose tables they bust and classrooms they cleaned. When you actually start to hear from people firsthand about what that struggle's like and what it means to their sense of self-respect and dignity to have to go to a soup kitchen, there needs, you need to be able to do something about that. In a move to force Harvard to negotiate a new contract for those workers, several dozen student activists took over venerable Massachusetts Hall on April 18, 2001, in a 60s style sitting. Someone given the secretary a letter to support staff. But Harvard President Neil Rudenstein refused to negotiate. I cannot give in, and if the university is at such a point where people say it's so badly off that we must give in, I'll resign before we give in. I think many of us decided to focus on issues of uh, low-wage worker abuse and exploitation precisely because we're at the center of power. Neither the students nor the workers expected an easy victory, but the occupation stretched from days to weeks. The tide began to turn when some influential faculty members came out in support of both the students' civil disobedience and the workers' living wage. The sitting in these students are doing is our process. Finally, after 21 days, President Rudenstein did an about-face. Harvard agreed to negotiate with the workers and re-evaluate the living wage proposal. Today, the lowest-paid Harvard worker makes $10.85 an hour, a significant increase over the previous rate. There's a little more respect there for the troops and these people because they're finally standing up as opposed to just shutting up, don't make waves. They're finally beginning to stand up and say, no, hey, we do have a say here. When we return, our wage slaves look for light at the end of the low-wage tunnel. Should the federal government pass a living wage law to ensure a wage based on the real cost of living? You tell us at ane.com. While some economists say that it is still possible for low-wage workers to achieve the American dream, other social critics argue that we have created a permanent underclass, which can never rise to the next level. What we have here is a very large number of people who are really just not a full part of American society. We now have a large category of people who are working full-time in the workforce, and yet they are poor. 20 or 30 years ago, uh, there were some people who were working full-time and poor, but not nearly uh, as many and, uh, and even not nearly as high a percentage of the overall workforce. They might not use the word poor when they describe themselves, but they know that they're not going anywhere. And whatever word they use, it doesn't really matter. They're still, they know who they are. If you ask, are low-wage workers today worse off or better off than they were 10 years ago? I say they're better off. If you ask, are they better off than they were 20 years ago? I say they're much better off. That's not to say that their economic problems have disappeared. Of course not. But they are better off today than they were in the past. And there's nothing that I see in the data that tells me that that trend will not continue. But though they may be poor, the five people we've profiled seem determined to make a better life for themselves. I might have a hard time making it. I might get frustrated sometimes, but you have to, you know, you have to look at the good side. I figure if you're gonna walk around and look at the lows, you gotta look at the highs too. So. I don't have any money sometimes, but I'm rich. I've got, you know, wonderful children, wonderful family, wonderful friends, and I got a great church. I mean, 
rich is a frame of mind also. You know, you either got money or you don't have money. I don't have money, but I'm very rich and, you know, in spirit and mind. Good morning, sweetheart. Uh, this is Mr. Rooney, the nurse for Lamar Jones. Randall Rooney is struggling to get certified as a vocational nurse, but he is determined to make a better life for himself and his family. The primary thing in my life, the thing that would make me happiest, is if I could earn enough money so that my children's college education could be paid for and this house would be paid for by the time they grow up, then I'd feel like my life is complete. I've had a checkered past. I've done some criminal things. And at this point in my life, I'm a, a good law-abiding citizen. I'm a productive person in the community. Uh, I'm trying to do things the right way, and I'm going to win this. I am going to win this. I feel lucky that I, at least I have a job. I have a roof over my head. I have food on the table every night. And there are people out there that don't even have that. They don't have, they don't have a thing, you know, and it's, and it's sad. And the relationship I have uh, with my daughter, Michelle, is very good. But sometimes there are times that I do want to shake her and tell her, look, you're doing exactly the same thing. I did when you, when I was your age. I didn't want this for you. I wanted a better life for you. I wanted you to do something for your life, you know, instead of just, you know, leaving high school, getting married, and having a couple of kids. You know, that's that's not what I wanted for you. It breaks me. It breaks me inside. Living on a low income, they mostly blame it on that we don't have educations or we have 20 kids and that we're not smart enough to do anything that they can do and they're better than us. But I don't think anybody is better than anybody. Money is the big difference in this and, and, and it always will be. If you have less money than what I have, then they consider you poor and horrible, but if they have all the money, they're, they stand high and mighty. I don't think anybody stands high and mighty in this world. To my most wonderful daddy ever, from your Princess Brittany, love you. Thank you, B. I think I went through a period of time where I kind of gave up. I lost a lot of confidence. I lost a lot of drive, but here in the past two years, it's been building back up, and I'm starting to feel more enthusiastic. So you roll with the punches, and you do what you got to do, and try to work with people, and, and it doesn't do anybody any good to be bitter or vindictive or blame is worthless. It's not going to pay the rent. The working poor are really uh, our society's major philanthropists. If you, for example, have to neglect your own children to take care of other people's children, or live in a uh, slum or a trailer park, so while you work to keep wealthier people's homes clean, you go without food because you're working to put out cheap, convenient food uh, for other people, you're making a donation to them. And I think the, the great scandal is that, that our American economy rests on all this unseen, hidden philanthropy of low-wage people. We recently spoke with the five families featured on tonight's program. Robert Nichols says that his work as a limo driver has slowed down even more leaving him months behind on his mortgage payments. His daughter Sherry, an honor roll student, is now studying for her SATs and hopes to get accepted to a good college. Sandra Gale Hurst tells us that her estranged husband has begun paying child support, allowing Sandra to quit her second job. Virginia Perry is still working at the dry cleaners and continues to pursue a management position. Ronald Rooney says that he's still working on obtaining his nursing license, and Sophia Acosta recently had an interview for a new job. 
The company wants to meet with her a second time. I'm Bill Curtis. Thanks for watching Investigative Reports here on A&E.